All right, next up, I'd like to introduce Kobe Hayashi, who is studying computer science at Georgia Tech under advisor Hayson Park. He also completed his practicum at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in 2021. Welcome, Kobe. Uh, thank you. So, hi, I'm Kobe. Um, I'm a PhD student in the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. And today I'll talk about uh, constrained low rank approximation sort of as a tool and try to motivate uh, HPC applications for it. All right, so a bit of a roadmap. So first I'll just talk about what is low rank constrained approximation for those who are unfamiliar. Then I'll talk about some applications of low rank approximation. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about some ongoing work on randomized algorithms for computing low rank approximations. All right, so what is it? So given a matrix X, probably some data matrix, um, you're gonna try to approximate it with two smaller matrices here denoted W and H. And mathematically we have you know, the following sizes and shapes. So X is M by N, W and H have the same you know, row or row dimensions as X that they correspond to. And then some smaller dimension K, and that's the low rank part. So K is usually much smaller than either M or N. And mathematically, you can write the objective function of this problem as so. We're using the Frobenius norm. And if you're familiar with this problem, you probably know that this is minimized by the singular value decomposition or the SVD. All right, so there are many variants of this problem. So my group usually works on one called non-negative matrix factorization, which has the same structure as uh, you know, the SVD. Uh, but instead, we add this uh, additional constraint here that W and H need to be non-negative. So usually X is also non-negative, so this constraint just means that the elements of W and H are either zero or some positive real number. There it goes. All right, well, why would you want to do this? Well, a lot of the times X comes from a data domain where the uh, you know, data itself is non-negative, so you want to preserve this property uh, in your factorization. So images, count data, graphs, uh, probabilities, all kinds of stuff. All right, so here's just a quick uh, toy motivating example of what NMF looks like and why you might want to use it. So the fashion MNIST data set is sort of like MNIST for random digits, but instead it's clothing items. Uh, so we can just visualize them and it's just pictures. So we have things like shirts, trousers, dresses, bags. And if you run the SVD on this, you get something that looks like this. And here you can sort of see like a mix of features. You can sort of see some shirts, maybe some shoes, bags, things like that. Uh, but if you run NMF on this, you're gonna get something that looks like this. And so uh, we call this a parts-based representation. So here you can clearly see you know, the objects from the data set appearing in your representation that you've gotten. And this often helps with uh, interpret interpretability or uh, produces better features for machine learning algorithms. And um, this is a toy example, but you can imagine if you had a more complex data set, you know, maybe encoding some sort of biological process, then being able to interpret the output of this would be very important. All right, so now I'm gonna tell a little bit, a little bit of a story to motivate uh, the research. Um, so in 2009, uh, Netflix offered a million dollar prize to improve their recommendation algorithm by 10%. And a bunch of research teams worked on this. And after three years, uh, a team improved the algorithm by about 10.5% and won the prize. So uh, that's great, good for them. They got the million dollars and presumably Netflix uh, took this algorithm and used it. Well, that's actually not what happened. So they didn't end up using that algorithm, but they used a different one submitted by a different team that only got 8.5%. Um, so why, why would Netflix do this? Why wouldn't they use the algorithm that gave them the best result? Uh, well, before I answer that question, I'm gonna discuss the algorithm a little bit. So the first one they did was something called a restricted Boltzmann machine, which I'm not gonna talk about. But I am gonna talk about how they use low rank matrix approximation in the algorithm. Um, so the first uh, part is the data. So the data that they gave people was users by films. And in it are uh, ratings. So how much did this user like this film? And this is a non-negative value, uh, presumably between zero or 10 or something like that. And the problem they solved was this. So this is NMF, uh, a little bit modified. So there's this M matrix, which we call a mask, which just is a element-wise multiplication over the uh, objective function here. And so it's easier to understand this just by looking at elements of the matrix. So basically, if we know the user's rating for movie J, that is Netflix gave us that data, or they've actually rated that movie, then we put a one in that matrix. And otherwise, we uh, put a zero there. 
And so this just means that maybe that user hasn't watched that movie or Netflix hasn't given us that data. And what we want to do is we want to uh, find these values or come up with guesses for these values. So they compute an NMF according to this objective. And then you take the rows of your factors and you just dot product them together. And that's going to give you an estimate for how much that user is going to like that movie. And so this is uh, one of the methods that Netflix ended up taking and using uh, for their movie recommendation system. And again, this is the method that, achieve, that achieved the lower score. And the first reason that Netflix gave on this blog post right here for why they did this was adaptability. So as new users watch movies or you know, people sign up for Netflix, they want to be able to add that to the algorithm. And the second one was scalability. So this algorithm scales well while the first algorithm, or the winning algorithm, doesn't scale. And this is important because the training data set that they gave out was only 100 million ratings. But in reality, Netflix had more than 5 billion. So they wanted to use all of this data. And so the point of the story is that scalability is very important in the real world, right? Just because you have a good algorithm doesn't mean that it's going to scale and work well at scale. All right, so, so how do we scale? This is a HPC fellowship. Um, but how often do we think about what are the ways that we can scale our applications? So uh, Philip P. Gibbons at CMU gave a talk at a parallel computing conference one time. And in it, he identified a bunch of ways in which we can scale applications. So the first one was, he called it uh, scaling up. And this is just adding resources to a node, basically. So parallel processors to a node, uh, faster memory, things like that. The second one was scaling out. So this is like using a supercomputer, using a cluster, using multiple nodes. And this is sort of classically what we think of in HPC, I feel like. And this is uh, what my group has done a lot of work on for low rank approximation. So a lot of our code is available here. And here are some of the publications associated with our uh, distributed algorithms for low rank approximations. Um, and the direction that I'm sort of excited about to work on is a, a third way that Gibbon said we could scale. And that's uh, scaling down. And at least in numerical linear algebra, we often don't scale down, and it's sort of become a new uh, big area of research for the field. And scaling down, classically, is often done just by sampling, right? So we reduce the amount of data or the amount of resources that we need for a computation, and we can scale in that way. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we scale down for NMF. But before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, we actually compute NMF. So again, this is our objective function. Uh, it's nonlinear, and it's NP-hard. So we're going to have to find some approximation for it. And what we do is we fix a subset of the variables, and we solve for the free subset. So here we're solving for w. We're going to fix x. We're going to fix h. And we get a new w. And then we're going to take that, and we're going to solve for h using the new w. And we're just going to repeat this until we reach some sort of convergence criteria. And these two problems here are called non-negatively squares problems. Uh, they're convex, so we can solve them efficiently using some sort of you know, convex optimization routine. And even more specifically, I'm going to talk about randomization for this method. So this is just a symmetric variant of NMF. So here, A is a symmetric matrix, and we just have one factor, H. And an application of this is uh, to graph clustering. So let's say we have a document corpus of academic papers, and we make those papers the vertices in the graph, and we uh, have a bunch of those, and then we connect them based on which papers cite each other. And then we're going to cluster the graph, and we take some matrix representation, the adjacency matrix, for example. And in this, we expect there to be sort of dense blocks along the diagonal, which will represent academic communities. So papers within the academic community sort of cite each other at higher rates. And we compute a sim NMF of this. And this will give us sort of low rank factors that identify the community. So the first one is finding the pink community. And the second one is finding the blue community. And for an example, we apply this to the uh, Microsoft academic graph. We can find uh, coherent topics like this. So the first one, probably some sort of mechanical engineering topic. I'm not really sure. It seems coherent to me. Uh, the second one, maybe some sort of biological topic. Uh, looks good. All right, so how do we randomize this algorithm? So the first one I'm going to talk about real quickly is random compression. So the first step for random compression is we just draw a Gaussian random matrix. And this is denoted by omega. And every element of this matrix is just a Gaussian random number drawn from the standard normal distribution. And we're going to multiply this by our matrix A. 
and it's going to have fewer columns than A, so now this matrix is smaller. And then we're going to compute uh, an orthonormal basis for this compressed matrix. And you can just do this using QR or something like that. Um, and this Q is an approximate basis for the leading uh, subspace of A, and that's what we want. All right, so then we're going to take that basis, we're going to multiply A on both sides, so now we get this matrix T, which is even smaller. And uh, this equation here gives us an approximation for A based on this routine, and we're just literally going to plug that into the sum NMF objective function, and we're going to solve this problem instead. And this is easier to solve because, or faster to solve, because we can compute products with QT, Q transpose against arbitrary vectors faster than A using that lower rank structure. And what this looks like on a dense problem, so this is a graph that's about 50,000 vertices by 50,000 vertices, um, and is mostly non-zero elements. The blue line here is the, or the blue lines here, are the deterministic method, and the green is a hybrid method, and the orange is the random method. So what the hybrid method does is it starts with the randomized method, and it gets us to a pretty good point, and then once it stops converging, we just automatically switch over to the deterministic method, and that takes us down the rest of the way. And using this, we get about a 4x speed up over the deterministic method, and we're able to preserve the solution quality. So that's great. Uh, so this is running that same method on the Microsoft Academic Graph that I was talking about earlier with the topics. And this graph is huge. It's 37 million uh, vertices with about a billion on zero, so it's really, really sparse. And this method fails to converge, we see. All right, so now we're going to try a different kind of randomization. And this one is called row sampling for least squares problems. So this is a least squares problem. Uh, we have A times X minus B. And we have some assumptions on A. And we're going to minimize and find the vector X. All right, so we're going to row sample for this. So say this is A, and it has five rows here. We're going to define a probability distribution over the rows of A. And we're going to draw a bunch of samples from this distribution, saying which rows of A we're going to take. And then we rewrite our equation like this, where S is just representing the action of taking those rows from A. And now this problem is smaller, so it's going to be cheaper to solve than the original one. And again, this is the hard part of this problem, uh, but I don't really have time to talk about it. All right, so this is what this looks like. And here we just have the ones in this 0, 1 matrix pick out the rows of A that we are sampling. And the Ws reweight these rows to preserve some properties of the sampling procedure. All right, so again, just taking it smaller now. All those go there and solve the small problem. All right, so then we apply this method to the Microsoft Academic Graph again. And again, we have the green line, which was the previous method, which doesn't work very well. Uh, the deterministic method is the blue one, and this row sampling type method is the orange one. And we see that it converges faster and gets about the same solution quality as this method. Um, so that's good. So that's scaling. All right. And the takeaway here is, I think, at least in Rand LA, that we're exploring the space of like what types of randomization work for what types of problems. And it's pretty clear, I think, from these examples that we need different types of randomization, different types of sampling to solve different problems. All right, and that's my talk. I want to thank my collaborators, uh, Srinivas from Argonne, Ramki from uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, my advisors, Hayson and Rich, and my other collaborators. And especially the DOE CSGF for the support over the years and for all the great memories. Thanks. <laughs>